I'm not used to that. I'm used to being down here with no lapel on. Does it sound, do I sound this good all the time? <laughs> no, nah, no, nah, yeah. It's a, well, it's always good to see everybody <clears throat> on Sunday nights. I'm telling you what, you can tell the winter time has set in. It is uh, officially 5.34, and uh, it's dark. It's dark. It's that time of year. That means I've been keeping track and trying to think in my mind, my timers for our Christmas lights should be going off here in about 15, uh, 10 minutes or 11 minutes um, for my OCD-ness, but it'll be going off. So anybody who wants to see how wonderful our Christmas lights look compared to the ones across the road, just drive on up. Just drive on up. But before we begin, is there any items of prayer that anybody would like to pray about tonight? Pray for my baby sister. Okay. Oh no. Okay. We'll pray for. Her. Amen. Absolutely. We'll be in prayer for. Her. Absolutely. Any other objects of prayer tonight? All right, let's go to the Lord. Father, you are so wonderful and worthy of our prayers and our praise and all that we could ever just give to you, Lord, and how gracious we are of all that you've done in our life and continue to do. And, Lord, we just love you so much and ask you to be with us uh, tonight that as we gather together that we would just spend time in your word, that we would lift you up and we'd praise you and we'd give you the glory and we would just absolutely exalt you and who you are and what you've done and how you are above all. You are supreme and Lord, we ask you to just be with us tonight as we are together. Lord, and right now as we come together, we ask you to be with Leanne's sister, uh, with her baby sister at this time, Lord. And you, you know the need, you know what's um, on Leanne's heart right now, and you know what's in her sister's heart. And Lord, we ask you to just be with her and to just work in her heart and her life that you uh, would just be evident and clear. And Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for the opportunity that we can come and pray to you and praise you that you would get the glory and that we can come to you, Lord, with an open, with open way that we can come directly to you and we can bring uh, what we need to to you. And Father, we ask you just be with us tonight, be with Leanne's sister and with the family and Lord, with Leanne in this time. And Father, we love you so much for what you've done and it's in Jesus' perfect and precious name, amen. Grace, Grace, Ella. We'll do page 451. We'll do Tell It to Jesus, page 451. Jesus
Kim, can I come? <laughs> I'll go back. I always said that it was always a joy um, when we was at Main Street Baptist Church that everyone we could take our kids um, back to the nursery back there, and they had what I always thought was like a five-gallon bucket of goldfish. And I said, I want that bucket because I love goldfish. Goldfish are great. They're one of the best things ever. I'm just a big fan of goldfish. But if you would, join with me tonight in taking your copy of God's Word and turning with me to the book of Genesis. As we're turning to the book of Genesis, uh, tonight we're going to continue on uh, looking at the life of Laban, a secondary man in a big God plan. You know, Laban is one of those individuals who's oftentimes overlooked. And last week, what we had was an introduction to Laban. You saw the beginning of Laban's life that we know of in Scripture. The first time that Laban was brought up in Genesis chapter 24. And now what we're going to do is continue on in Genesis 24. And really go uh, through from verse 50 to 61 and see where Laban... Uh, hey, he's already been introduced to us in the first part and in the first message, but tonight we get to see Laban uh, and the servant of Abraham as they deal together. And what you have here in Scripture, I believe, is one of the best little pictures of a contrast and comparison of two people. Now, the servant of Abraham is probably one of the best pictures, Old Testament pictures, of either a per, the person of Christ or the person of the Holy Spirit. The servant of Abraham that you see is just absolutely sold out to Abraham. Now what you're going to find is if you go and you look and you uh, read about the servant of Abraham, the way he just is so obedient uh, to Abraham, he is sent by Abraham, he goes wherever Abraham tells him to, he's obedient to Abraham, that he's just a, a good picture of the Holy Spirit today, of so faithful to the Father, so obedient in going and taking care of the ministry of the Father, of just sending out and going and going, and he has no name, no address, no anything. He is just a servant of Father Abraham. And I believe he is one of the best pictures we have in the Old Testament of the Holy Spirit in, in the servant of Abraham. But tonight, what we're going to see in verses 50 to 61 of chapter 24 is the comparison of the servant of Abraham and Laban. Now, Laban is introduced to us there, first of all, and we get to see who he is, just that, that just the type person he is and the, the underlying nature of Laban and who he is and his attitude and his, and his direction and his motives. His motives are what drive him. His motives are what's behind him. And in uh, the verses 34 all the way through 49, what you have is the servant comes and he just spills the beans he tells every bit that he was told by Abraham to go and share. He just spills everything. He tells Laban and Bethuel about his call, about how Abraham sent him, uh, how much he was supposed to give, how he was supposed to do it, um, the direction he was supposed to go, the place he was supposed to go, the method he was supposed to follow. And he just absolutely just pours it all out before Laban and tells it to him. And what we have now in verse 50 is Laban's response to the servant's message that he was given, uh, how he was given this message, how he was given this business to take care of. And now Laban and Bethuel and Laban and his mother and Laban in general is the one who handles the response. And what we have is just that comparison as you see the two going back and forth. So if you would, join with me in reading Genesis 24, beginning in verse number 50. Genesis 24, beginning in verse number 50. The Bible says, Then Laban and Bethuel... Now, Bethuel is um, the father of uh, Laban and Rebekah, the son of Nahor, Abraham's brother. This is Abraham's nephew. And Laban and Bethuel answered and said... The thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you either bad or good. Here is Rebekah before you. Take her and go. 
and let her be your master's son's wife as the Lord has spoken. And it came to pass when Abraham's servant heard their words that he worshiped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. Then the servant brought out jewelry of silver, jewelry of gold and clothing and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. Verse 54, and he and the men who were with him ate and drank and stayed all night. Then they arose in the morning and he said, send me away to my master. But her brother and her mother said, let the young woman stay with us a few days, at least 10. After that, she may go. And he said to them, this is Laban, do not hinder me. Since the Lord has prospered my way, send me away so that I may go to my master. So they said, we will call the young woman and ask her personally. Then they called Rebekah and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So they sent away Rebekah, their sister and her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, our sister, may you become the mother of thousands of ten thousands. And may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. Then Rebekah and her maids arose, and they rode on the camels and followed the man. So the servant took Rebekah and departed. So tonight what I want to preach about is a comparison in God's hands. A comparison in God's hands. What you have right here is just the, the aftermath of the messenger of the Lord sharing, the, or the messenger of Abraham sharing with Laban and his household and Laban and his family all that he was sent to do according to Abraham. And what you're having here now is the way they handle it and it's comparing. What you're seeing is God is revealing to us and showing us this kind of character contrast and comparison. He's looking at them together. And you're going to see that the servant and Laban go back and forth and back and forth in this last little part of this narrative here as they're continuously going at each other. Or not really going at each other, but kind of going off of each other. So when you see here in the very beginning in verse number 50, it says, Laban and Bethuel answered and said, it was the first thing you have here is that the servant was being very transparent. And Laban was being very accepting. The first thing you see here is the transparency of the servant and the acceptance of Laban. Now the servant told everything that he could. He shared every bit of the message. He didn't hold anything back. He gave every detail that he possibly could to Laban. The servant shared everything. He gave Laban every detail of the entire thing. He was transparent as could be. And now what you have here in verse 50 is the acceptance of Laban of the message. He is accepting the message, that transparency of it all. He is bringing it in. He's accepting what's being said. He has accepted the truth of it. And he is just saying, okay, I can't say much. And we can see that. And he begins in verse 50 when he says that we cannot speak to you either bad or good. Now that right there is kind of the key of it all right here. That's the kind of central idea of it. We cannot speak to you either bad or good. Well, literally what he's saying there and kind of the notion behind it is, you know, we can't, it's not our call anymore. It's no longer in our hands. It's something that's outside of us. You know, we can't decide if it's bad. We can't decide if it's good. We just have to accept what's there. We have to accept the fate of it. There's nothing we can say. There's nothing we can do. We just have to accept what's being said. It's, we can't say it's bad news. We can't say it's good news. All we can just do is say, oh, well, just accept it and go on with it. You know, that's how he, ex he is portrayed at this point. He is not allowed, really, by the text. He's not given the opportunity to go either direction. He's kind of bound now in a situation that he can't and cannot go any other way. He is bound to it. He has to accept. He says that we cannot speak to you either bad or good. And why? Because in, before that, he says the thing comes from the Lord. The thing comes from from the Lord. Now that word thing there is a very important word. You know, most of the time you hear thing, it just means thing. It's just, it's just a thing. But that word thing is not just a normal thing, it's a very important thing. That thing is a very special thing with a very intended thing to be thinged about. It's a thing. 
And that's why he says there, the thing comes from God. The thing comes from the Lord. That word thing is the same word that he ended with last time. It's the word debar. It's the word message. It's the word to speak. He says this debar absolutely comes from, <coughs> excuse me, the Lord. This debar, this message, this errand, this business comes from the Lord. Therefore, we cannot speak to you either bad or good. If something is from God, no one can really say if it's bad or good. They have to just accept it or deny it. When something is clearly in evidence as coming from the Lord, there's nothing you can say. You just have to accept it. You can't say it's either bad or good. Laban had to accept the message from the messenger. The messenger, the servant of Abraham, was transparent. He shared it with him as from God because it was, and that's the only thing he could do was to say, it's, we can't say it's either bad or good. We can't say it's not in our hands anymore. It's not on our call. It's not in our terms because it comes from the Lord, the transparency and the acceptance. But notice what also he says going forward in verse 51. Laban says, here is Rebekah before you. Take her and go. Now, I absolutely believe that this is a, mo a moment in time when Moses is reflecting the very first part of Abraham's command and the servant's uh, commission to go forward. It's the same words in the same way. Take and go. Take what you need and go. Abraham at the beginning was said, take what you need and go. The servant was commanded to take what you need and go. Now what you're having is the exact same wording that Moses later on is being inspired to pen that they could see that notion there, the hand of God throughout, and it's to take and go. It's that reflective way. It's the commission and the command to take and go. Do what you need to do do. Take and go. Get what you need and go where you must go. It's that transparency and that acceptance of it that we are seeing here. He's not able to say, don't take a thing and stay. He can only say, take it and go. But notice there's more as that in verse 51. And let her be your master's son's wife as the Lord has spoken. Now, can you imagine what that word spoken probably is? It's the same word as thing, the same word as speak in the very first part. It's the same word as message, the same word as Aaron. As the Lord has the bar. The Lord has spoken. It's the Lord's business. It's the Lord's command. It's the Lord's errand. It's His. He has said it. He has spoken. He has commanded. Therefore, take and go. It's His business. He is the one who commanded it. Therefore, go. You must accept. You see, the first thing we see here is they're comparing, and as Moses is comparing these two here through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, is that he is comparing the transparency of the servant to the acceptance of Laban with the transparency of the message, the clearness, the evidence. The servant of, the Lord, uh, the servant of Abraham shares everything, and Laban must accept. He has no other choice. He has to accept what is being said, and he's just simply saying, okay then, I can't say either good or bad, take and go. But notice what goes on here in verses 52 to 53. The servant, and it says, and it came to pass uh, when Abraham's servant heard their words that he worshiped the Lord. You see, this part now, what happens is there's a transition in this comparison. First of all, uh, Moses is comparing the transparency of the servant to the acceptance of Laban. But now what you have is the giving nature of the servant and the receptive nature of Laban. Notice in verse 52 when he says that the servant heard their words and he worshiped the Lord bowing himself, bowing himself to the earth. The first thing that the servant gave was he gave credit. He gave credit. He didn't take it into his own hands. He didn't say, man, I've done such a good job. I've been so transparent. I've just done everything I was told to do. He did not give himself glory. Rather, he turned around and gave credit where credit is due. He worshiped the Lord and bowed to the earth. 
Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I will be honest. It's been a while since this old boy found himself on the earth, bowed before the Lord. Most of the time, we just say, oh, I'll just bow my head right here and I'll just do my thing. But when's the last time you can truly worship and say, God, you have done it. You are the one who deserves the credit. You see, it's the giving nature. And the servant was giving credit. He was giving worship. He was giving praise. He was saying, Lord, it is all you. And I love the way we see that in just the nature of the servant, how he was giving and he worshiped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth, literally all the way down in that word that he was on his knees and his forehead bowing to the earth before the Lord. He was giving of praise and of credit and saying, Lord, it's all you. Earlier today, I was watching the National Lampoon's family vacation, or the Christmas vacation, sitting there just flipping through the channels. My phone rang. As my phone rang, I looked down and it said, Greg Corn." I answered the phone and as I was sitting there on the phone for 45 minutes or so like that, I mean, it just kept going on and on and on. He told me about what he preached last time he preached. Man, I'm telling you what, he just let me have it today. But he made a notion of something I've never thought about. And it's been a while since I've even heard someone even give mention to it. He said, if you'll look at the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus gave thanks before everything took place. The servant of, Moses, or of, of Abraham here gave thanks to the Lord because of the message he had heard, but he gave thanks and he praised the Lord before he left. Rebecca hadn't been given to him yet. Rebecca was not betrothed and married to Isaac. He was giving God the glory before the miracle was about to happen. When's the last time you thank God for what he's going to do? We thank God after. Lord, thank you for working in that situation. Thank you for being in that situation. Thank you for going about this and that way. But I have come to find out, and I was convicted. I had to go through it and look again. I'm telling you what, if you look in Scripture, most of the time prayer and that which is given in praise and in adoration to God is done before it's taken place. The servant gave God the glory before he left with the prize not after. He said, God, thank you for what you're going to do. You see, he bowed to the earth. He was giving credit. He was saying, Lord, you're going to do it. I don't have to wait until it's over. I can thank you now. But notice not only was the servant giving credit where credit's due in praise to the Lord, but he was also giving very abundantly. It says the servant uh, brought out jewelry of silver, of gold, and clothing, and gave them to Rebekah. The first thing he did was he gave to Rebekah very abundantly. And it, what you see here is it's, he, he is giving to her gifts upon gifts of these royal items, these, these royal things, this gold and silver and clothing. But notice who he is giving it to. This is his future master. Rebecca is going to be the future master of him. Right now he is under Abraham and as he gets back later on, you will see if you'll look down in verse 25 or in chapter 25, uh, <coughs> or excuse me, not the end of chapter 24 where he is coming forward and Rebecca asks as she sees Isaac coming out and she says, who is that man? He says, that is my master. He is not just giving gifts to Rebecca. He's giving gifts to the person who is going to be his future ruler, his future master, his future overseer, the one who is going to take care of him, the one who is going to be over him. That's Rebecca. That is the wife of his master. He is giving to her gold and silver and clothing and everything he could. But not only that, it says in verse number, uh, the end of verse 30, 53, he also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. He was very giving not only to Rebecca, but also to Laban and their mother. 
Now, what are these? These are just the dowries and this high-end royal gifts, that which was paying for Rebecca and also giving them honor and dignity. He was giving to them these precious things, these precious ordeals that was uh, elaborating and, and just glorious things to pay for the hand of Rebecca. You know, she would have cost a whole lot back in that day. It would have been something very much, very important to pay for someone, to pay for a wedding arrangement. It's very important for you to understand that he gave not only to Rebecca, but also to the family. But notice if you would, in 53, the very end, he gave precious things to her brother. And to her mother. Now, if you'll remember last time, I said you have to pay very close attention to the order that you find things in Scripture. You must pay very close attention to the way things unfold because that order is important. God just didn't throw it all together. There is a reason behind it. There is a reason behind it all. Laban is the only name that is mentioned in this passage beforehand as to her brother and to her mother, but also you're going to see that he is the only one that's mentioned and shows his crucial role through the whole story. It's Laban who's the brother who is in this part and Laban who is the one dealing with the servant in the beginning. It's Laban who is found in the one taking the dowry. It's Laban who is the one saying that he is willing to give his sister over. It's Laban who is the one that is dealing with the servant and it is Laban who is the one who is being contrasted between the two. Laban is the only name that is mentioned and the only one that is found here apart from Rebecca because he is the crucial role in the two. It's Laban. He's a secondary man in a big God plan. He is a secondary man in a big God plan. This is all about Abraham, Isaac, and Rebekah, yet Laban is the one who is being contrasted to the servant in order to really bring about the will of God. Laban is, contrast, is contrasted and compared with the servant because the servant was so giving and Laban was very receptive of it all. Laban is shown to be very accepting of the message of the servant and the servant is portrayed to be very transparent with the message. But now we're going to go forward in verse number 54 and it says, And he, ate, and, he and the men were with him, ate and drank and stayed all night. And in the morning he woke up and said, Send me away to my master. But her brother and her mother said, let the young woman stay with us a few days, at least 10. Now we're beginning to see a difference in character. The first part, it's almost like they're just kind of going with the motions. The servants sharing, Laban saying amen, accepting it, can't change a thing, it's not in my hands anyway. The servant is just giving and giving and giving and Laban is receiving and saying, thank you very much. He's taking what's rightfully his as the dowry and he's just going along with it. Yes, everything's just kind of flowing. But now in verse number 54 on, what you have is the transitional shift in the character of Laban. You see, the servants remain the same and the servant was now very persistent. But Laban became very resistant. It says, and the servant woke up and said, send me away to my master. Take me, send me away. Send me away. That word is the word Salah. It's the same word that Pharaoh uses later on in Exodus. And whenever he's speaking, he says to free us, Salah, let us go, free us, liberate us. Let us go from this bondage. Let us go from where we're at. Send us away. It's that same word, Salah, to free us. Let us go away. Let me leave. Send me away. He's persistent. He wants to get back to his master. But in 55, her brother and her mother said, let the young woman stay with us at least a few days, at least 10. Now, what you see here is actually them kind of holding back for just a little more time. Holding back for just a little more time. Now, if this just, let's just go ahead and say it. I'm not there yet, but I have two that I have to one day give away. And I'm probably going to say, let me have them for about you know, the rest of their life, and y'all can't have them forever. Uh, but I know one of these days, both of them are going to meet good men. I'm praying for that, and I'm trying to teach them what's right and wrong. Uh, they better meet some good men. I still give foot rubs and back rubs. And I'm telling you what, if they don't meet them a good man, Harper already said, I'll send them. She did. She said, if he don't treat me good, I'll just send him off to the next girl. I said, amen, that's my girl. 
but one day it'll happen. And that's what he's referring to here. It's that the let her stay with us just a few days, at least 10. It's the idea of the saying goodbyes and giving hugs while you pack, of holding on just, just, just a few more days. Just I, I, We can't give her away just yet. Just wait a minute. Just, just a few more days. A few more days. How about just 10? I don't know how you go from few to 10. But few to ten is a big jump. Few is three or more. Ten, that's a pretty good bit. They said, just a few days, just ten. And But that was custom. They would last and they would give ten days to pack and say goodbye and to make sure everything was wrapped up. You see, the servant was being very persistent and Laban was being very resistant. The servant said, free us so we can go about the will of God. Go about what Abraham wants. Isaac needs a wife. The promised seed needs a wife. And Laban says, "Uh, just a few more days, resistant to it, holding back on it, saying, I would rather not. I would rather her just stay here a few days. Just hold on a minute, wait a little bit, give us a few more days together. Let us just finish saying goodbye, give our hugs. It'll take 10 days. And after that, she may go. And he said to them, that is the servant, do not hinder me. Since the Lord has prospered my way, send me away so that I may go to my master. That was very, very disrespectful. The servant went against common protocol. The common custom was to wait 10 days and then the wife and future spouse could go to the husband, be betrothed and be made the wife and everything and they can be consummate the marriage and they can be married. The servant was breaking the protocol of the time. He says, no, 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 we're not slowing down anymore. You're not resisting it. We're not holding back. I'm going to be persistent because we have got to get this thing going. Do not hinder me since the Lord has prospered my way. When he says that there, it is showing that the divine precedence and authority overthrows family tradition and desires. What you see there is literally the idea of the divine authority of God in the life of Isaac and Abraham and Rebekah and the promised seed took the paramount supreme place to that of the family tradition of Laban and Bethuel and Nahor. They had something better to do. Folks, God is more important than what we want. What God wants is more important than what we want. God's timing is more important than our timing. You know, we, get, we cannot go past God, but we also cannot be resistant to God. We have got to move with His flow. And that is why we see it evident there that the servant, being a picture of the Holy Spirit with no name whatsoever, is being very persistent on time. We must go now. It's the idea of being unhindered. They wanted time, but the servant served the Lord. They wanted to wait and say, well, just give us a few more minutes. And the servant said, no, 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 no. We don't have a few more minutes. We have got to go. Because God is working in this. This is bigger than you, Laban, and it's bigger than me. This is the work of God. The servant was being very persistent, but Laban was being very resistant. Him and his mother were resisting. They said, no, 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 let's just do it the natural way, the normal way, and go along with the protocol. But he said, no, we must be persistent and follow God. And now you can see going on in verse 57 to 61. We're going to end with this last point here. As they're contrasting together and that pivotal point there in 55, whenever you see it change there and as he was now different, it was a different mentality in Laban and the servant. And in 57 on, you're going to see this last contrast was between the servant and Laban, how the servant was obedient. But Laban was prophetic. The servant was being very obedient. You do not see any more words from that point forward. The servant really doesn't say anything. Servant speaks no more until he sees Isaac. The servant doesn't say another word until they are riding on camels and Isaac is coming their way. The servant is silent. 
He has done his duty. He has done what he needed to do. His task was over. He accomplished all he could, and it was in the hands of God Almighty now. You know, one of the greatest things you'll ever find in Scripture is when someone starts talking and when someone stops talking. He stopped. It was no longer in his hands. He did what he could. He stopped. He was obedient to every command of Abraham. He was obedient to and worshiped God the whole time. Now his obedience required silence. He had to stop and say, Lord, it's in your hands now. You have to take care of it. You have to be the one to go about it. He never said a thing. But in 57, you're going to realize his obedience to no longer go any farther, to follow God. He was already doing everything he had to do. He accomplished everything that God required of him, what Abraham required of him. And at this point now, in the hand and mind and ways of Laban, God brings about what only God can do. I've been waiting for this part right here. I've been waiting the whole time for this one because this is my favorite part. So they said... We will call the young woman and ask her personally. We're just going to find out if she wants to go. Then they called Rebecca and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. We'll ask her personally, Will you go? And she says, I will go. If you would, take your Bible and flip back just a little bit into chapter 24, the very first part of it, and we're going to go into verse number 6. Chapter 24, beginning of the chapter, beginning verse number 6. 24, 6. But Abraham said to him, this is Abraham commanding the servant, Beware that you do not take my son back there. The Lord God of heaven who took me from my father's house and from the hand and from the land of my family and who spoke to me and swore to me saying to your descendants I give this land he will send his angel before you and you shall take a wife for my son there and if the woman is not willing to follow you then you will be released from this oath only do not take my son back there. What was the first thing you see coming from Abraham, uh, from Laban because of the obedience of the servant? Now as Laban is working in a prophetic way, fulfilling what he had no idea he was fulfilling, but in the hand of God, even Laban can do what God wants. The first thing he did, and the only thing we see here, is that he worked in the way of the, the daughter of Rebekah wanting to go. Abraham said, if she is not willing to go, you're loose. If she's not willing to go, if she doesn't want to decide to go, if she will not follow you and come back, you're loosed. Laban says, well, we'll just ask her if she wants to go. And she says, I'll go. She wanted to go. You see, it's working in the hand of Abraham and by the will and ways of God. When you think of the strangest, weirdest ways that God could work, and that don't make a lick of sense, but yet it proves His sovereign authority and how He still brings about what He wants to in Rebecca. But notice, if you would, going on in verse 59, So they sent away Rebecca, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men, and they blessed Rebekah. So they sent away Rebekah. If you would, flip back with me just one more time into chapter 24, the very beginning, but let's go to verse number 37 this time. 24, verse 37. You see, the first time Abraham told the servant, if she's not willing to go, you're free, you're loose. But now in verse 37... The servant is sharing with Laban. Now my master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell, but you shall go to my father's house and to my family and take a wife for my son. And I said to my master, Perhaps the woman will not follow me. But he said to me, The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with you and prosper your way. <clears throat> and you shall take a wife for my son from my family and from my father's house. You will clear from this oath when you arrive among my family. For if they will not give her to you, then you will be released from my oath. Do you see the flip? 
Do you see the change? The first one was Abraham told the command that if she's not willing to go, you're free. Now in the second part, the servant is telling to Laban that if you don't let her go and accept it and allow her to leave, then I am free. But in the hand of God, by the will of God, in the ways of God, both come to pass without the servant saying a thing. Amen, preacher. It's the obedience that the servant has in the beginning. It's the obedience that the servant fulfills and he is faithful to the command of Abraham and he stops and zips his lips and says, I've done my part. Now, Lord, you have to take care of the rest. And what happens is that God takes care of the rest. God's the one who handles the rest of the business. God is the one who handles the end of it. They are there and the woman says, I will go, fulfilling what Abraham said. Then the family says, we will send you, and they send her away, therefore fulfilling what the servant says that Abraham says. Both had to come about, both come about because God said so. It's the contrast between the two. You see, Laban was very accepting of the gifts and Laban was very hesitant and very resistant to his sister going. But because of the nature of Laban, God used him in the motion and the notion that he was going to use the idea that Laban was resistant. Therefore, when he lets go, you know it's God's will. It was by the nature of Laban that God used Laban in order to prove to the servant that Rebekah was it. If Abraham is the father, Isaac is the promised son, the servant is a picture of the Holy Spirit, who does that make Rebekah? the bride of the promised son, which is us. It is through Abraham's command, the Lord Father's command, for the promised seed and the son who is Isaac, by the working of the servant who is the picture of the Holy Spirit of God, going out from the Father, going out from the throne, going in full command, obedient to the Lord, silent when need be, obedient in every way, transparent and clear, who then brings back the guaranteed, absolute, sufficient, set, steadfast wife for the son who is Rebecca, who is a picture of us. Man, that was good stuff. Amen. The servant goes out and brings back to the son the bride. Amen. You see, it's a secondary man in a big God plan, which is the instrument by which God brings about his holy and divine purpose as a picture for us today. It's the, in the life of Abraham and in the life of Isaac and in the life of Rebekah. This isn't just an Old Testament story. This is picture. This is topology. This is theology. This is God working. And God works in the same way then as he does now and will until. until. It's the same way. It was through the resilient nature of Laban that you now have that resiliency and that nature that God brought about the betrothal of Isaac and Rebekah. <coughs> it's because of Laban. Laban's a picture of the world. Laban's a picture of the world. He's a secondary man in a big God plan who even though he causes what seems to be a frustration, it's all in the hand of God, who's just a secondary man and a big God plan. But in the hand of God, you can contrast the two, and the servant compared to Laban only goes to show how good the servant is, how good Abraham is, how good Isaac is, and how wonderful it is to be married to the promised son. Amen. Amen. You see, Laban is just that person who's on the outside, just secondary. But it's because of him and his nature that you have Rebekah and that you have Isaac and that you have Abraham. 
He's a secondary man in a big God plan. But thank the Lord for his providence and how he works through the nature of people like Laban who then come about in order to fulfill his will. Let's go to the Lord together. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you for the sufficiency of your word. Lord, how it reveals to us how you work, the picture, the type of it, Lord, how we can rest assured in it and know how good you are and just rejoice in it. And Lord, how you are still bringing a wife to your son. Lord, that promised son. Lord, thank you for putting us in your family, making us the bride of Christ. And Father, we love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name, amen. I love you. I hope you have a...